Welcome uh, to all of you. At this time, I'd like to welcome the president of St. Vladimir Seminary, Archpriest Dr. Chad Hatfield, to lead us in a word of prayer and introduce uh, today's event. Thank you, Deacon Alexander. Uh, th this is really a moment of thanksgiving. Uh, we're grateful for the work that St. Vladimir's and the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative have been doing, uh, actually a little over for five years. We're looking forward to hosting the next conference in September. It's also a time of Thanksgiving as we Orthodox prepare for the great feast of Pentecost, which is the feast of the Holy Trinity. So I thought I would open this particular seminar with a prayer of Thanksgiving that is based upon and addressed to the All Holy Trinity. Mm. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. We thank you, most gracious Trinity, that in the multitude of your compassion for us, from the time that you called us from non-being into being, you have not ceased day and night to bestow benefits on every rational and irrational creature, so that through all and in all, your most holy name might be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, source of all good, that through your indescribable will, you were pleased to honor the human race with your image. We thank you, only begotten Son, who in your incomparable love for us descended to the depths of Hades and through the cross granted joy to the world and to us eternal life. We thank you, co-eternal Spirit of truth, who give us wisdom and understanding and cry, Abba, Father, in our hearts, so that we may know the gifts of adoption in God and ever share them with gratitude. Glory to you, all holy and consubstantial, life-giving trinity forever and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Right at this time, we'd like to also welcome our speaker for uh, this afternoon, Professor Terry Mattingly, professor, author, um, and journalist. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mattingly, for joining us. Glad to be here. I believe there's, there will be an introduction of some kind. Well, certainly I'll wade right in here and okay. launch this off. This is a, a topic which is most timely. And one of the things that uh, St. Vladimir's and the Orthodox Christian uh, Leadership Initiative have been doing is uh, really addressing issues that concern the Orthodox Church. Um, and we're trying to give a voice, a, a leading voice, a leadership voice to address them. Sometimes they are what one might call the third rail. Uh, they're topics that sometimes people just simply dodge and decide to avoid. And that's not a healthy thing for us. And so when one thinks about journalism in the Orthodox world and somebody who can actually sort of raise the bar and get us thinking, Terry Mattingly, of course, comes immediately to mind. Um, you'll note, I think, uh, somewhere in this conference that he and I have personally known each other since the mid 1970s, some time ago when we were both uh, living in Denver. And I'm very grateful to the co-host uh, with this, uh, uh, Professor John Mark Reynolds, uh, the headmaster of St. Constantine School in Houston, and also an adjunct professor here at St. Vladimir's in the Doctor of Ministry program. So we're looking at this issue of uh, screens, technology, how that's impacted culture, and we're, we need to take a lead in actually beginning to to address the issue, but uh, particularly for those who are in leadership position, and for me as someone associated with St. Vladimir's Seminary, this is especially important for our future priests and lay leaders. So we're grateful for this topic, we're grateful for the presenter, and uh, uh, Terry, I'm turning it right over to you. Thank you very much. The obvious place we need to start out is with the term screen culture itself. What is screen culture? Well, start here. 85% of individual Americans now own smartphones. And 96% of those between 18 and 29 are carrying smartphones. 
uh, the Pew Forum and, and other researchers haven't given us a number yet for children, but suffice it to say, if, if you know our world today, you know that lots and lots of young children are walking around with smartphones. Now, we're not going to be dwelling on the statistical horror stories you have been hearing about links between digital screens and loneliness, anxiety, depression, pornography, suicide, and a generation of frustrated single men living in basements playing video games. I, I will note that the first exposure to online pornography is now believed to be 11. And if that's the average age, you can imagine then what the low end would be. All of those issues are real. Uh, I'll briefly discuss the hellish side of screen culture later on, but this is not my main goal today. I'm not here to argue that digital communications technology, even Zoom, as we have all been experiencing, is not part of God's good creation. Our screens are fallen, period. For better and worse, we all know that after a year and a half of church life during the COVID pandemic, but we also know that it's possible to do good and at times even holy work with the help of digital screens. We know that some of what we've learned will be of use during the future, especially the creation of online resources, parish libraries, et cetera. Yet we also more than know, we know more than enough now about the distractions of digital worship, the exhaustion of trying to funnel church life through listservs, Facebook pages, and endless hours of streamed meetings of various kinds. Some parishes have wrestled with divisive rumors and conspiracy theories spread through toxic forms of social media. And to top it all off, the pandemic left all of us, priests and parishioners alike, locked up at home with our digital screens, dominating our life even more than normal. Yes, this is another example of dealing with the reality that all of God's creation is both glorious and fallen. What matters are the choices we make and the sins that confound us. That is the stuff of confessions and sacraments and yes, even the work of Orthodox seminaries. This is why we're here today. This is what we wanna talk about. Now, first, a few personal words about who I am and kind of what I'm doing here. It goes without saying that I'm a journalist and not a scholar. I don't have a doctorate in anything. My academic background, an MA and an MS, has focused on a mix of mass media studies, history, theology, political science, and law. In other words, I was preparing myself to be a religion beat reporter and columnist, and that's what I've been doing in one form or another for 40 plus years. I have taught mass media and journalism in Christian liberal arts colleges, and briefly, I taught a combination of mass media and apologetics in a Protestant seminary. And we'll come back from time to time to some of what I learned from that. But what matters today is that I'm an Orthodox layman. My father was a Southern Baptist pastor, and I cherish my family heritage there in Texas. I, I spent a decade in the Episcopal Church, and it was during that time that I met many others on the same road into the ancient faith. A few, Father Gregory Matthews Green and his wife Frederica, were very close. Father J. Stephen Freeman, who would become my godfather. The late Father Gordon Walker, who would become one of my family spiritual father, he would become my family spiritual father. An Episcopal priest that I met in my Denver days named Chad Hatfield, and the Greek Orthodox priest there named Father Christopher Metropolis. At one point, I found myself discussing the evangelical Orthodox phenomena with the Greek Archbishop Iakovos, who said he knew that someday there would be an Orthodoxy for America, but that he had no idea what that would look like. All of us have been a part of that story ever since. Nearly a decade later, I was part of a circle of seekers who joined the Church of Antioch while living in the mountains of East Tennessee. Leaders of the only Orthodox parish there would not even talk to us about service times because we didn't speak Greek. I said we were seeking to convert to Orthodoxy and one of the people there hung up on me. So we had to start an Orthodox mission in order to join one. Years later, that mission was merged with the struggling East Tennessee Greek parish through a cooperative effort of a Greek bishop and an Antiochian bishop. It's now a convert-friendly Greek parish led by an Antiochian priest, the son of Father Gregory and Frederica Matthews Green, by the way. Small world. The Orthodox in America will need more miracles of this kind. 
In addition to starting a mission, my family spent a decade plus in the lively Holy Cross Parish on the edge of Baltimore under the leadership of Father Gregory. By the time of 9-11, my family was active in a predominantly Syrian Lebanese parish in South Florida. In, the, in a parish crisis, my daughter took over as choir director at the age of 14. Now, my family's back in East Tennessee attending an OCA parish founded by Father Stephen Freeman. That's mostly converts and a strong cell of Russians and Romanians and so, who from time to time call themselves reverts. This is only the second time I have addressed an Orthodox audience outside of my own parish. The other time was in 2006 when I was asked to speak to the Orthodox Christian Laity Conference in Baltimore. I stressed that I was new to Orthodoxy and not much of an expert on the faith. They asked me to address this topic, however. What do the converts want? I said I could handle that. I'm going to end today with one lesson learned on that topic. This time around, I have been asked to address some of the challenges facing Orthodoxy at this unique, painful moment in time as we edge out of the COVID crisis. I told Father Chad I was willing to do that as a layman who is a journalist with some mass media professor insights thrown in. My godfather, Father Stephen Freeman, is a systematic theologian, and he will certainly confirm that I am not a theologian. Um, but we have discussed many of these issues. I do, however, know a thing or two about mass media and how media technology affect what we know and what we think we know, what we think we know about a wide range of subjects in public and private life. To understand where I'm coming from, I need to share a parable with you about my graduate studies in mass comm at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. The key here is the reality that technology tends to shape the content of the information in our lives. There was a very world famous professor there named Dr. James Carey, uh, who later went back, he died just a couple of years ago, who went back to Columbia University in New York. And he had a class where he taught the history of the printing press. And he used the printing press as um, a case study for how technology shapes life. On the first day of that class, he walked in and sat on the edge of the desk and looked out at us. And we're all, you know, shaking. It's the father, the famous James Carey is talking to us. And he said the following, would the Protestant Reformation have happened without movable type? And then he walked out of the room. That was all he said. He didn't even hand out syllabi which of course produced exactly the effect he wanted, which was we, we all was in a hubbub began talking, what in the world does this question have to do with anything? Well, he was a Catholic thinker and knew his way through these subjects. And was, as we began to talk about this issue, it hit us all that if you look at the major doctrines of Protestantism, salvation through faith alone, that, that stands on its own. Protestant version of the priesthood of the believer, how would you have the priesthood of the believer without a printing press, without Bibles? And then finally, how do you have sola scriptura without Bibles, without a printing press? That doctrine, technology shapes content, went with me in the early 90s when I moved to Denver Seminary while set, trying unsuccessfully to build a set of core classes in which pastors and counselors examined the many ways that entertainment and news media affect the lives of people in our congregations, as well, of course, as the unchurched people we say that we want to reach. When I left Denver, I spoke at a 1993 independent Episcopal conference inspired by Father Stephen Freeman's infamous ecclesiastical perestroika paper. I, I did a paper called, um, and now a word from your culture, which, did, which ended up in the book that came out of that conference, Shaping Our Future, Challenges for the Church in the 21st Century. Some of you will find it interesting that after I read my paper that day, a, a young rising voice was chosen to be the respondent to my paper, uh, a young man by the name of N.T. Wright, um, that probably remains one of the highlights of, of my academic life. The opening of that paper, I'd like to read it briefly to you because it has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. Here's how I opened then. True or false, it is impossible to talk in terms of the practical details and statistics 
of how modern Americans live their lives without addressing the role played by television and other forms of news and entertainment media. True or false, most churches have little or nothing practical to say about the role that television and other forms of news and entertainment media play in the daily lives of most modern Americans. True or false, most churches have little or nothing practical to say about the daily lives of most modern Americans. True or false, this applies to my church. And then my thesis statement, I believe our media are constantly sending out signals that can help the church go about its ministry and mission work in this post-Christian culture. Sadly, the church and our seminaries are ignoring both the content and the social role of popular culture mass media, which are among the most powerful cultural forces in modern society. Now, that was a long time ago. Did you notice something missing in that list of mass media forms? Now, we, we knew the internet was coming. Futurists let us know that computers were going to be a growing power in daily life but few were predicting the waves of digital signals that would soon be, con we would all be consuming via various devices, smartphones primarily, that make up now what is simply called screen culture. This brings me to one additional quote from my Denver seminary class so long ago, drawn up from an encounter from a seminarian who doubted that mass media studies were relevant to someone who wanted to be a pastor. He wanted to focus, he said, on discipleship and the daily lives of his people and the people he was trying to reach. I responded with an improvised three-part definition of discipleship for mod in modern America. As often happens in media theory, this definition is stated as questions. And my three improvised questions were, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you make your decisions? I noted that if you could answer those questions without colliding with the power of mass media, then you had a promising future in ministry to the Amish. Yet I also knew at that time that the Amish were wrestling with the rise of heavy metal bands in their culture. But we could, that's another subject for another day. But how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you make your decisions? Surely these are questions that are linked to what priests often wrestle with, with believers in confession. Now, that was all 30 years ago. We were living in the age of cable TV. Can we pause for a moment and think about the impact of the myriad digital screens that now shape the content of our daily lives, especially those of young believers? There are many ways to approach this. I'll briefly look at three topics that can help case, service case studies, those signals I mentioned earlier, where we can see issues in church life that are linked to the role of technology in our lives. Obviously, there is the crisis of screen culture itself. This has been a reality for decades in our homes, but it went into hyperdrive with the arrival of the iPhone and its premiere at the Macworld conference in 2007. The late Steve Jobs, as he played with this thing on stage, candidly said, I could play with this thing a long time. Consider this commentary from Southern Baptist Seminary President Al Mohler. The iPhone has become something considered a necessity. And in this world, if we're playing by the world's terms, of course it is. The question the iPhone presents for us is who owns whom? Do we own the iPhone? Or increasingly, immorally, does the iPhone own us? The rise of the smartphone specifically has more than anything else removed parents as the ultimate authorities and sources of truth in the lives of their own children. Now, this is one of those places where I could go off for an hour and talk about the connections between America's pandemic of loneliness, depression, and isolation. But I would urge you to look at some of the charts on those factors sometime and note the sharp upward arc at about 2007, 2008, as the smartphones take the screen culture up to another notch. It's become almost unorthodox to question 
the links between smartphones and anxiety. But if you Google smartphones, loneliness, and anxiety, you will get 20 plus screens of academic research and news reports on the nexus of these subjects. Now, do the same search on Google, but this time do smartphones, sleep deprivation, children. At this point, I guarantee you there will be more. There are only 10 screens of research and coverage linked to smartphones and gender dysphoria. I would encourage parents and priests to consider reading the controversial book, Irreversible Damage, by Abigail Schreier of the Wall Street Journal and Yale Law School. Buy this book while you can. At this point in time, it's still available on Amazon, but it's being banned in libraries across the United States. Now, much of this screen culture preceded the COVID lockdowns. Early in the COVID crisis, the CDC noted that suicide attempts by female adolescents soared 51%, dipped down, and then returned to 26% increase by the summer of 2020. There appeared to be many causes, but of course, one factor that connected all the others was that children were locked up at home with their screens as their only means of interpersonal contact with friends. Here's another, briefly another subject, video game addiction. Have any of you paid attention to the debates about this in South Korea? They've actually now passed a law in South Korea, the Youth Protection Revision Act, or the shutdown law, or Cinderella law, an act of the South Korean National Assembly that forbids children under the age of 16 to play video games between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m., they have recovery centers for video addicts in South Korea now. But let's back up for a second and I'll talk about parishes for a second. Priests and parishioners got a taste of this screen culture, or at least a, one that made us confront it during COVID tide. The culture of information silos that are pushing Americans on the left and the right further and further apart in politics, entertainment, and religion is something that even came to our parishes. The key is a truly radicalized form of individualism, building on top of America's history on that front. Here's a quote from the Harvard Law School lawyer, David French, who's a well-known writer and journalist now on these issues, from his book, Divided We Fall, a new book on the possibility of actual you know, breakage in the American states and in our country. French said, quote, it's time for Americans to wake up to the fundamental reality. The continued unity of the United States cannot be guaranteed. Right now, he said, quote, there is not a single important cultural, religious, political, or social force that is pulling Americans together more than it's pulling us apart. Well, what can we do about that? What role does media play in that? We'll come back to that again with some recommendations at the end of the talk and a reference to a book, The Tech Wise Family, written by an interesting Christian thinker named Andy, Andy Crouch. Second, I want to talk about the rising pressures on education at every level in our lives. Another thing, obviously, that has to do with young children in public and most private schools. The link to screen culture is not direct, well, at least not until we were all under lockdown, but it's linked to a basic question. Who is educating our children? Think of those discipleship questions I asked earlier. How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you make your decisions? When we talk about parish education programs, what is the reality? How many hours do we have to work with our own children in comparison with their schools? And of course, the even larger internet and entertainment culture. It's easy to obsess about the worldview and dogmas of Hollywood, and I don't want to get into that too much, but Hollywood screenwriter and former nun, Catholic nun, a friend of mine, Barbara Nicolosi, had good cause when she named her weblog Church of the Masses. She was saying that when it comes to thinking about ultimate issues and questions, the vast majority of Americans turn to entertainment more than real sources in academia 
organized religion, and I would also emphasize mainstream journalism. Just to give you an example from my own past, at Denver Seminary, I was teaching classes about popular culture and apologetics, and I used a lot of examples from Star Trek and Star Wars. And what I found was interesting. Uh, my students had had classes in world religions and secularism and materialism, and they, they, they kind of knew how to talk about that. If, if a Hindu person had come up and confronted them, they probably knew how to talk to them about the basics of Christianity. They had no idea what to do when all of those topics showed up in Star Trek or in other examples of popular culture. So I throw this out as a toss away line. Have any of y'all given any thought to what the worldview is, the beliefs about ultimate realities, miracles, good and evil? What's the worldview of the 23 movie Marvel Comics universe? What was the theological hook in that movie Endgame? Does this matter? Once again, the basic question, who is educating our children? I would recommend a classic book that was written. I studied it in graduate school in the, the early 1980s. A New York author named Marie Wynn wrote a book called The Plug-In Drug. And the main idea was that parents have become addicted to television because it's an easy way to control their children's behavior. I'll paraphrase something she had to say. We are allowing our children to be raised by characters that if they showed up on our doorsteps, we would call 911. That was written 40 years ago. Now, another area where I could spend a lot of time is higher education. I was in the, the Baylor Department of Church and State in 1977 when some of the early briefs began circulating for a case that would become the Bob Jones case at the Supreme Court. In the midst of all that, it suddenly hit the head of our program where this was all going. And he said, in a couple of decades, we're going to get a Supreme Court case in which homosexuality, for example, is going to be established as a basic civil right in American life, equal to race. And when that happens, all of Christian higher ed will be at risk. As someone who's taught in Christian higher education, I, I have heard debates about these sorts of subjects, even in Christian schools. And one Catholic priest who studied the subject closely once told me that in his opinion, the two primary issues in Christian education today, do faculty members believe their primary duty is to liberate students from the narrow worldviews of their homes their parents and their home churches? And are our schools willing to openly state this? We oppose the doctrines of the sexual revolution. Now, we heard about some of that recently with the lecture by Rod Dreher and the Benedict Option. My point here is we can't talk about any of these subjects without looking of the role of mass media, specifically entertainment and popular culture and journalism in this debate. Finally, a third brief case study. You've all heard the phrase demographics is destiny. Well, sometimes doctrine is destiny as well. And how we handle these things in church life is destiny. An Anglican bishop friend of mine, Episcopal bishop once said he was in a circle at Canterbury with bishops from around the world. The Americans were talking about this and that and the other of doctrinal changes that needed to be made in ways we needed to move into the future or the church would die, et cetera. Finally, an Anglican bishop from Africa leaned forward, looked at the American bishop and said, where are your children? Where are your converts? And where are your priests? Asking rather blunt questions. Well, where are our children? America is in a crisis. Look at the painful realities of marriage formation and naturally and crashing birth rates, a related topic. Maybe you saw this Associated Press headline a few weeks ago. The U.S. birth rate falls to the lowest point in more than a century. 
The U.S. birth rate fell 4% last year, the largest single year decrease in nearly 50 years, according to a government study. I'm reading from the AP report. The rate dropped for moms of every major race and ethnicity and nearly every age group, falling to the lowest point since federal officials started tracking it more than a century ago. Some of you, priests especially, may have noticed that the median age for first marriages has fallen to 30 plus for men and 28 years and above for women. Once again, what is the connection to screen culture? Maybe it has something to do with topics such as rising levels of loneliness, anxiety, peer pressure, and screen addiction. Do a search for young, for United States young adults living with parents, and you'll be looking at 10 screens of studies and news coverage. One of my favorite books recently, in spite of its pinkish cover and lousy name, is Elizabeth Cantor's The Jane Austen Guide to Happily Ever After. Her thesis, the Austen novels are about young women trying to discern male character. But in that age, they had the help of communities, extended family, and their churches. Now, post-college, most young people have to search for marriage partners at work, in bars, and yes, online. And where did they get their primary images for marriage? romance, love, commitment. Statistically, well, yes, their homes, but also popular culture. What are our parishes doing to create new marriages and families in a culture in which young adults are fleeing to our parishes from lives dominated by trends in the workplace? And frankly, they're seeking fellowship in an era dominated by entertainment and the internet. Priests, Think about this. Who are the hurting people coming through the doors of your parishes right now? How many of them are young adults who in many ways have washed up on our shores, so to speak, after crashing in social media and in an environment dominated by popular culture? Are our churches ready to talk to them? What are the challenges we face here? So let me end with a couple of practical suggestions. At some point, parishes are going to have to deal with this. They're at least going to have to mention it. If not, our people are going to assimilate. I'll come back to that word. They're going to assimilate into the screen culture without even realizing that it's happening to them. It would help, of course, if we had libraries of books and, yes, ironically, digital materials addressing some of these topics. Who would prepare these? The last thing I want to know is do is add more burden to the lives of our priests. But at the same time, somebody has to take this on. I think our seminaries and archdiocesan leaders need to help with this and need to help priests and parish leaders add some materials to church life. I think priests should consider appointing one or more lay people to their parish council specifically for the purpose of social ministry and library skills. It sounds ironic to try to fight the power of social media using social media. The simple fact, I know here in East Tennessee, so many of the people who walk through our doors get there because our priest has a lively presence in social media. They've already consumed hours of internet materials from orthodoxy, thank goodness. But they need more than that. They need to taste and see as well as go online. It's easy to focus on the negative. We need positive ideas for parents, especially. especially. The, the book, The Tech Wise Family by Andy Couch, Crouch is an easy place to start. And I would recommend it be used in parishes. I saw recently a video presentation about him that's available online. Here's some of his basics. Parents need to study their own homes room by room and think about where digital technology is used. It's good, for example, to have one, repeat one, television in a setting where family members and visitors can use it together. The goal is to avoid having individuals in different rooms binging on private screens with no sense of accountability. Also, the family's main computer should be in a public place. 
with the screen facing out into the room. Another tip from uh, Crouch, husbands and wives need to know each other's passwords and be able to help hold each other accountable. Parents should install software security programs on their computers, Wi-Fi systems, et cetera. That would be a good topic for a church forum. What are the realities of internet security? What are the realities of trying to have any control over the role of the internet in your home? At the very least, parents can strive for family members to eat dinner together with zero digital devices laying there on the table. It's also important, Crouch said, to establish that our screens go to sleep before we do, and that parents insist that bedrooms, including their own, be as screen-free as possible. We're back to that subject of sleep deprivation. Many teens report that they struggle to sleep because their social media programs never leave them alone. Would we dare in the context of our church, let alone in sermons, set this basic goal, no screens in the bedrooms of young people after dark? Could we even dare to bring that up? Could we dare to encourage parents to have avoid smartphones for their teens altogether? Maybe they need what we used to call dumb phones, ordinary cell phones. Could we discuss whether you really need a smartphone before you go to college? The bottom line, at some point, Orthodox parents need to be able to say the following words. Our home is not like other homes. Our family is different in significant ways from other families. And if parents are going to do that, what help? could they get from the church itself at the national and diocesan levels? I'll give you a quick case study that I found quite moving. A couple of years ago in Colorado, a number of young people, teen, older teenagers, were affected by the suicides of several of their friends after cyberbullying. And they created, on the, let me see if I can say this clearly, offlineoctober.com, off lineoctober.com. The Denver Catholic Archbishop saw this, heard about it, and had this to say, quote, one theme I see running through the stories of teens who struggle with suicidal thoughts is the pervasive influence of social media on their identity and their sense of self-worth. The teenage years have always been a time of uncertainty as physiological and emotional development take place. He noted Bullies gained access to their peers on a scale never seen before. Not only did fallen human nature obtain a virtual megaphone it could use 24-7, but the anonymity offered by some apps removed the accountability provided by platforms that require users to identify themselves. Digital self-harm, he called it. What they did during this month is these Catholic young people didn't ask people to give up their cell phones, but they asked their friends to de delete the three crucial social media apps through which cyberbullying was taking place. And they organized through their parishes events involving actual face-to-face -face life. They had a day to learn how to cook. They had a day where they went to visit the elderly in homes and play cards and board games with them all afternoon. They did hiking, they did fishing, they did other forms of social work, volunteer work together. As one student told me, his goal was to actually have the life that he was pretending to have on social media. Now, if we took some of this on, to use a Southern phrase, if our churches went from silence on this to preaching about it, would they have gone to meddling, to use a phrase from Texas life? Well, if they worked in tandem with their bishops, I think some of these topics would be fair game. To my knowledge to this day, there are zero core courses in any American seminary, in any tradition that address the impact of mass media 
on the lives of people living in our culture. Thus, the Denver Seminary effort in the early 90s failed. Key faculty members there said that these issues had nothing to do with church ministry and with the daily lives of believers. As a finale, let me link this to one other term. That term assimilation that I used earlier was at the heart of my 2006 address to Orthodox lay people. Let me read just a section about that in conclusion. America is all about assimilation, but I need to stress that Orthodox believers face two different forms of assimilation in our lives today. One asks them to assimilate into America at the level of culture and language. The other tempts them to assimilate at the level of doctrine and practice. I believe that Orthodox Christians have divided into two different camps, whether this choice is conscious or unconscious. In many parishes, we see people who are struggling to assimilate into American culture, but don't know what parts to accept. They're struggling to retain their language and to some extent their art. But at the level of faith and practice, they have already assimilated and their children have as well. You walk into their homes, you see little or no iconography. Yet you walk into their church and nobody, they're not speaking English. It's an interesting mix of what they've given up and what they've chosen to cling to. As an Orthodox priest of an ethnic parish once told me, quote, most of the members of my congregation have never been to confession in their lives. They have no idea that this even exists as a part of our church. They see no connection between confession and the life of our parish and the sacramental reality of our parish. As threatening as it sounds, our goal, if there is to be a united orthodoxy, is to be united in worship and sacramental practice. This unity will blend gifts from across our great ethnic traditions. However, to be a vital growing orthodoxy at the congregational level, it will be a vital growing orthodoxy that at the congregational level can welcome Americans with open arms. It will make them feel strange, but it will be a place they can become a part of and even change over time. This orthodoxy will assimilate at the level of culture and language, but not, it will not assimilate to America at the level of practice sacrament and doctrine. It will not compromise on the essentials. Now, that's a big subject, but I want to link it back to our topic today as I end. What are the primary means of assimilation in American culture today? What are the things that make us assimilate at the level of the basics of our life and things that compete with our church? And with the practice of our faith? Once again, those three questions. How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you make your decisions? Trust me, friends, there is more to discipleship than those three questions. But my question today is, in the screen culture age, is there anything less than those three questions? Can discipleship be less than the issues raised by those questions. If the church wants to make disciples, yes, and save souls, what are the practical forces pulling people in the other direction? Can our churches continue to ignore factors such as screen culture? Can we continue living in a state of mind that I like to call the separation of church and life? Unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mattingly. At this time, we'll transition into uh, our panel discussion. And so I will uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. John uh, Mark Reynolds to uh, kind of lay down uh, some ground rules of how, how this will work. And as well in the Q&A section, which again is at the bottom of your screens, you'll see Q&A, you can click on that and you'll be able to type in uh, questions and comments. Dr. John? So uh, we do encourage you to ask questions inside the Q&A uh, bar. Uh, this is primarily a discussion uh, between the three of us, but we also want to take your questions. Uh, let's try to stick to the contents of the talk, uh, and I will try to monitor the Q&A section, and as we chat, uh, bring those out. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the Orthodox uh, Christian Leadership Initiative uh, that I have the privilege of, I chair the board for, uh, for helping sponsor today's lecture. Uh, we're meeting at St. Vlad's in the fall uh, for a conference that actually will be together, will be incarnate. Uh, and that's uh, how I would like to start uh, a first follow-up question uh, to Professor Mattingly. Terry, uh, it's uh, a real conversation, I have argued other places, has to take place face-to-face -face because we're people. Even a phone conversation is a kind yeah. of virtual conversation. Uh, the technology tricks us because it's so quick into thinking we're talking to the person, uh, whether it's texting or doing something else, and we are communicating. We're doing information distribution. But there's a difference uh, between having a class in my office with the cuckoo clock. I, generations of college students have done that. Uh, we usually have a candle going. Uh, we eat some kind of food together. Uh, that occurs at St. Constantine, the college program at St. Constantine right now. Uh, there's a difference between that and even a Zoom class. And we had to do a few Zoom classes at the end of uh, the semester uh, in the spring of last year. And those were okay, uh, but they were different. Uh, is it possible to have a genuine friendship that goes uh, to the deepest level online? Or is it the case? I mean, I'm, I'm asserting that a, a kind of fullness, a kind of genuineness is only available uh, if we meet face to face. It's ultimately in the DMIN program that I'm privileged to begin working for at St. Vlad's, people meet face to face. You can distribute information, have lots of good kind of uh, discussions that are like letter writing in some ways, uh, very fast letter writing, I think of as texting. But this, this kind of deep incarnational discipleship uh, is face to face. Is that true? Do you have some responses well, to that? What are, what's going on with that? Well, I think that's implicit in the statement, oh, taste and see. I mean, I, I know lots of people, I mean, let's face it, books can't handle it either. <laughs> I know lots of people who have converted into Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism in particular that really thought that that shelf of books that they had was everything they needed <laughs> to enter the faith and that they could somehow read their way into the faith. No, at some point, you need an incarnational faith. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some appropriate secondary uses of technology. I mean, that's what I, why I kept referring to libraries. I think that there are a lot of talks and things that could be collected on church websites as a secondary resource. But man, I truly believe that they also could be used in face-to-face -face encounters. If, if, if St. Vlad's, for example, is doing a tremendous lecture on something, we can all sit in our homes and watch that. But it would be much better Let's say it's a topic related to marriage and family. If we had people actually sitting in our parish hall watching that lecture together, and then our own priest led us in a discussion of it and a follow-up of it. If you're going to use, say, some of the wonderful talks by Frederica Matthews Green as a part of a, um, a process of catechesis with catechumens, fine, but that can't replace the process. That can't replace the lived experience of actually breaking bread and spending time with people who are going through that experience with you. In the, just in the context of a seminary, for example, people are talking about totally online um, doctor of ministry degrees, for example, at which point, you know, I kind of want to do this, you know, you know, in front of them. I, I think you can have resources that help the process but it can't replace the process of face-to-face -face education and most of all, the relationships that are at the heart of true education and helping young people make the decisions about what they're gonna do with their life and how they're gonna live their life. So I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you there. And some people find it interesting then that I think that an event like this could end up stored on parish websites. Well, okay, but let's let's be let's be blunt. <laughs> it's just a video unless the parish and the priest then agree to do something to help pull parents together for conversations on these topics. 
It's just a video unless priests, maybe in a deanery, have a session where they talk openly about this. I would, didn't know if I was going to mention this, but I think I'll mention it here. My own priest here in Oak Ridge, um, Father Daniel Greeson, went to Russia right before COVID broke out. And as a part of that visit, he asked priests there, what are the major challenges you face in your ministry here in Russia? And priest after priest after priest, I think he said there was only one exception. All of them said smartphones. And the smartphone, of course, was not just an object. It was a symbol, you know, of, of a voice, a debate into the lives of young people and into the lives of other people. Um, but I'm totally with you on this one. I think they are a glorious but fallen tool. And we've got to be very careful how we use them. We can't let them replace the basic need to come and see. Well, sort of fundamentally, I, I'm curious what you think about this, Father Chad. Fundamentally, uh, we can't go to the liturgy and experience the body and blood of Christ virtually. Uh, I uh, once ran a conference uh, for online discussion. You know, what is it to be online? Uh, it had a terrible name, God blog uh, conference. Uh, but one of the final ones, uh, there were a whole group of people uh, in the Protestant tradition totally moving church online. And this included having avatars for virtual baptisms, Father Chad, and having virtual communion, uh, <laughs> where you would bring bread and wine uh, with you to your house, and your avatar, uh, your little character, would experience this. And this was viewed as the future of the church. I I'm wondering if you have uh, any thoughts about that? Is it fundamentally, uh, I was listening to Bishop Thomas of the Antiochian Archdiocese uh, this week, who said fundamentally, uh, we need to go to church. Now, there are times when we can't go to church. I have a parent who's ill right now and can't go to church. Church comes to him uh, in some ways. But Father Chad, do you have any response to this right, right away? As, as I, I think you're muted still. Here we go. I do. And, you know, as a member of the faculty here, you know that at St. Vladimir's, so uh, we're fully committed to being residential and we're never going to be training priests in front of a screen. It's that simple. Uh, one has to live out their salvation within the context of community of being formed to be a servant leader. So we recognize that. At the same time, there are people that are anxious to have courses that can be offered online in a hybrid format or fully online. But, you know, We've learned a lot, you know, in this past 18 months with yeah. COVID. And um, we know about live streaming and that sort of thing. A lot of predictions, you know, that, that many places people would not go back to church. But there's something specific about us as Orthodox Christians, and we have to come to terms with that. Uh, we aren't part of the mainstream American religious scene. We're different. Uh, and how this is impacting us in terms of our own spiritual lives uh, is quite significant. For instance, you mentioned virtual life. And I, I've been hearing confessions now for again over 40 years. Uh, I have begun to hear people's confessions in which they are confessing that they have a virtual life, that they have created a screen family, a screen house. And uh, at first I was like, I need to do some peer check with some of my priest brothers to see if this is a phenomena. They confirm that it is. That's, that's something that, again, I, I would expect that many people are totally unaware of, but it's a growing phenomenon. On a positive note, uh, one of the impacts of COVID seems to be, and I hear this from many priests, um, and several of them are relatively recent graduates from this seminary who are serving in the mission field, they say they have larger catechumen groups than they've ever seen. Hmm. Uh, so what does that say? In a culture of nuns and duns, it does mean that people are searching. And maybe as inept as we are uh, of presenting orthodoxy in American culture, people are beginning to find us. But at the same time, I'm hearing from these same priests, these people who are searchers are doing screen searches. And they type in orthodox Christianity, orthodoxy, 
and they're landing on some sites that are not worthy of the name Orthodox. And I think that's another issue that the leadership of our church needs to begin to address because it's putting people off. Uh, they begin to discover these things on heterodox uh, sites claiming to be Orthodox and uh, they panic. Many of them are like, huh, well, I guess it's not what I thought it was and I might as well stay with the devil that I know. So within our own so-called Orthodox world, there's a lot of screen culture that's actually damaging people and, and off-putting as they're searching. My, so, point I mean, my, yeah, my point today, again, is once again, we're confronted with this glorious but fallen reality of this technology, which is one of the reasons why I think it's important for a parish to get in it, into it at the level of, it, of a screen of resources the parish actively affirms, and that the priests and their bishops even have said, these are worthy of use. You know, we recommend that when these people show up, this is where you can help them with these resources, but also make sure they know the resources can't replace the people. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I really like what you uh, started with, Terry, because I, we really want to underline uh, hooray for screen culture in so many ways. I mean, I'm very grateful for the fact that if there's a book I want to quickly read, uh, there was an era of my academic career uh, where that would take months for that yeah. book to be found. Uh, now it was kind of romantic at Allen's bookstore in Philadelphia that would do months of search for A. Taylor's commentary on Plato's Timaeus. And months later I would get it in a brown paper package wrapped up with string. And that's all very romantic, but it meant that months and months later when I needed a book, I got it. And there are other books on pop culture that I maybe want to read once and read very quickly. And they're relevant for about a two or three week period. And an e-reader is actually a pretty decent way of not, you know, throwing the paper back away uh, of a book I'm going to read once. So there are lots of, you know, I can see every Shakespeare play ever written, at least a plausible performance of it uh, somewhere online. These are really great resources uh, for, for life, and we don't want to overlook those. Uh, I'll throw it out to both of you, uh, this question. Academics used to be able to play a certain game, uh, and the game was... Uh, you teach one way uh, and then you publicly are another way. Uh, and so uh, apologists, for example, uh, might have one presence in the academic community and then go around to parishes and say other things that were more religious. This is no longer possible. Uh, your whole life, uh, your whole academic life is there. And I'm curious what both of you would say uh, when we were talking about whether they're like hyperdox websites or heretical, you know, uh, sub-orthodox websites. Uh, academics can't do that anymore. Uh, we can't dissent from church teaching uh, and have our little academic life without scandalizing the faithful because our academic life shows up online no matter what we do. Uh, and that strikes me as mostly a good thing, uh, a kind of transparency and honesty. But it does mean the bishops have to perhaps be more forceful, right? Like, this is not okay, this is okay. Uh, we don't wanna to get to an imprimatur perhaps, uh, but something very close to, uh, this is not where we're going. In other words, this kind of double academic life can't be played anymore uh, in, in any way, shape or form. Uh, speculation, for example, better be marked speculation, academic speculation, uh, because people that aren't uh, aware of academic speculation are going to stumble on it as straight up teaching. I, again. Terry, I'm curious how you would respond to that. There, there's no hiding anymore. In other words, your well, academic. I think that there's still a lot of things that happen in classrooms that parents never find out about, you know, and that the world never finds out about. I think it, it's not the cloister that it used to be, but that's, I think that's still a phenomena we, we need to take seriously. But you're, you're making a perfectly valid point, especially for, academics who become involved in online forums. At that point, Father Chad, you have screen searching now going on about seminaries and colleges and parents doing deeper research than they would before. Trust me, as a journalist, I have watched trustees shake in their shoes over the thought of independent or even semi-independent campus newspapers actually describing the content 
of debates in campus life yes. so that parents, donors, and trustees would find out about them. Um, now, the internet, um, <laughs> it has its strengths and it has its weaknesses, but it is what it is. Um, it's coming for you, you know, in one form or the other. Um, and this will increasingly be a force in, in education. But I, I want to stress something that Father Chad alluded to. We all have learned at the personal level, emotionally, some of the limits of using these screens in the last 15 months. I mean, I have a friend who's fighting cancer, and I'm so thankful he got to take part in some of our book studies and things like that during COVID because he was under the strictest of lockdowns. But friends, when he walked in on Good Fr at Good Friday, because our church in East Tennessee with our bishop's blessing did Holy Week in a tent, uh, we had like a tent revival next to our parish during, and did Holy Week outdoors, which raised the safety factor for many, many people to get to come to those services. Um, Seeing my friend walk in was a thousand times better than whatever contact we got to have online. I was thankful for the online contact. That's not the same as embracing the man when he walks in on Good Friday. We, we had a comment uh, in the Q&A, and we'll get to some of those really good questions that are there here in a minute. But we had a comment about how wonderful it is to have access to monastery bookstores and let me underline something. It feels like screen culture is awesome at information distribution, which is, is why I issued the warning uh, that maybe some of our bishops need to take seriously the fact that people have megaphones uh, that are claiming to be orthodox that maybe they don't wouldn't normally have had megaphones or have different kinds of megaphones, have public megaphones that have to be accounted for. But there's a good side to that. And, and, and we do want to underline this. This is, you never want to be fear-based, right? Ah, uh, you know, panic yeah. in the streets. Uh, so let me get to uh, Holly Benton, who's the director of OCLI. I hate to give her preference, but I will just because I can. Uh, asked a really good question. What's the opportunity or even responsibility to evangelize through screens? How could we weigh the risk of technology betraying the content of the message of the good news? Uh, you know, I try to engage in some active dialogue in social media, you know, when to quit, when to keep going, how snarky to be, uh, trying not to mic drop, how kind to be. These are hard questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wondered, Terry, start with you and, and please, Father Chad, what's the response here? How can we evangelize appropriately in screen time? Uh, the only other thing I want to say in that regard is we really encourage all of our parents both of college age and under uh, age students to look into dumb phones. And this is an example of a very modern dumb phone. This is a light phone uh, that you can text with and will receive phone calls so you can be safe, but it doesn't have a camera option, which people need to realize is its own uh, bundle of problems. Uh, but it is helps people be safe. So if you want someone to be safe, I take it with me on dates. Uh, I hate to admit that I can be distracted by screen culture, but if I'm going to go out, my 35th anniversary is coming up on Monday. If I'm going to go out, I often take this with me. So uh, Holly's question, how do we evangelize? Uh, we can't with a dumb phone. Uh, should we be in this space when we're not on our dumb phones? Uh, what do you think of this, Terry? Two separate questions here. <clears throat> One, it's my fervent belief that with very few exceptions, we can't limit what God does, but with very few exceptions, mass media is pre-evangelism. And what we're seeing on many of the most powerful topics in American life is that entertainment is pre-evangelizing our children and others to an to a openness to hearing certain points of view. Now, on the internet, it seems that they're act, it's going beyond that. That, that we have tight circles of believers online that are literally helping shape people's decisions and their actions. Um, once again, we could get into a very negative topic here, uh, like the debates about uh, gender dysphoria and the role of smartphones and the internet in that. But I, I wanna stress again, pre-evangelism is what we're talking about here. Nothing replaces 
come and see. Nothing replaces, oh, taste and see. Um, nothing can replace standing in a choir for a year and singing your way through the entire, you know, you know litur liturgical calendar, you know, and what we learn through that kind of experience. Now, the second question um, Remind me again the second half of, of her comment there. Um, so if we're not, there is a place for dumb phones. I tried to show oh, an example. Yes. If yes. we're going to be online, how do we do it appropriately? If the medium's the message, and Terry, you say that a lot. I I, I realize someone else did before you. Before I, you. But if the medium's the message, can we evangelize it all online? How do we do it uh, without plunging into error? Okay, well, first of all, I specifically mentioned that I think it would be appropriate if our parishes and maybe even deaneries, regional conferences, as like the Antiochians do, the OCA does more by deanery. Um, I think it would be appropriate if there were events to discuss. Can we recommend to our parents certain types of phones over others? Can we raise for discussion the question of when do you need a smartphone and what takes its place before that? Parents are terrified to discuss these issues because of the potential for conflict with their, with their children over them. So I think this is a subject where they need to hear the relevance of the topic made safe or as safe as possible by their priests and even their bishops. Now, I do believe that our, that our um, the OCA, the Antiochians, the Greeks and others, I'm seeing steps that they're beginning to appoint specialists for this area, people who are talented in this area and who have looked at the good and the bad. And um, I, I know the founder of our parish, Father J. Stephen Freeman, has been online for a very long time. And we frequently have discussed how he learned, I can't take the following subjects online. There, you, know, you just simply can't handle the firestorm that's going to come out of it. How do you take a conversation offline? You know, where do you set the limits? These are serious, important topics that I believe seminaries, church leaders, and priests need to be helping us with, which means they need to be discussed. It, it really staggers my mind that we haven't talked about this and how little education is ready for this. Uh, I think I taught one of the first online classes in the 1980s on uh, something called the Commodore 64, and the younglings around can look that up. Uh, but the modem was so slow, I had to anticipate the dialectic question uh, before it could finish, because I could see the individual letters yeah. uh, forming. Uh, that's how slow communication was. Uh, I had to walk up the internet, both in the snow, both ways uh, back yeah. then. Uh, Father Chad, as you hear all of this, uh, how nimble do you think that uh, church leadership is on this topic right now? And, and how much do we, be, this is gonna be pretty fast change by orthodox standards. This change has occurred, what is this smartphones 20 years old at the oldest? Yeah, exactly. And you know, this is the kind of thing which needs to be a topic for clergy conferences. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, ministries like uh, Faith Tree uh, Michelle Mujaya, you know, they're, they're doing a good job of, of cultivating an interest in having this as one of our educational tools, a topic that we're not avoiding. You know, here at St. Vladimir's, it's kind of like a thread that runs through several other courses, but there is no specific one course uh, dealing with this topic, as Terry mentioned. But it comes up constantly, you know, in other courses. Uh, in parish administration and evangelism courses, we look at the positive side of how we do evangelization, you know, using social media. Uh, one of the things that my students talk about all the time, I have them do a search in a parish administration course is, gosh, we, we went and looked at, at uh, just websites of parishes, and they're always shocked because some of them are like three years old, five years old, 10 years old. So again, that's another thing that we need to be conscious of in orthodoxy. But when they find a good one, they're very excited about it. And again, it becomes one of these tools where conferences like what we're doing now can actually be made available to a much wider audience. My, my fear is that sometimes, Terry, if people are on a platform like Twitter, 
and they Google orthodoxy, I, I can guarantee you what you come up with isn't normative. Mm -hmm. It's not the bishops, right? Uh, and and sadly, it's it's not mainstream orthodoxy. It's uh, uh, people who are are weird in one way or the other. They're either trying to generate topics, uh, discussions, and pretending that there are discussions about things the church isn't really discussing uh, that aren't up for grabs, pretending they're up for grabs, uh, or they're like 18 year olds uh, who think orthodoxy is what base. Uh, I shouldn't try to use a cool language or I'll just show how uncool I am. And that concerns me. Terry, what, what it can be done about this? I see it more on Facebook more than anywhere else. And, and I'm not on Facebook a lot. I use it just as a way of communicating with family and a, and a few friends. And I don't take a lot of political, cultural, journalism, media debates into Facebook. I just don't think the medium can handle it. Uh, it's so easy for it to turn into shouting at each other. How many of us have wished that the, our smartphones and our computers had what I would call an ironic font, you know, to <laughs> where you know, we, could, we could punch the ironic font and people at the other side would know we're joking. But just, you know, that kind of tone and context is lost in online communications. I'm sure our priests have all learned so much about this in the last 15 months, so, where they've, they've been forced into online relationships with so many people by COVID. A question, a question from Father Aaron Walker, uh, which I'll just read. What specific examples of screen culture discussions and activities do you know of that have been welcomed uh, by Orthodox teens and young adults? And what changes have these brought to their lives? Trying to create a position for family and youth ministry director at my parish and this kind of approach should be a big piece of their ministry. Does anyone know of this? And notice, I, I really like this question um, from Father because it asks that the teens and young adults viewed it as successful, not the oldsters like I am, right? Oh, that went really well, I said to myself. Yes. Uh, that's, I'm scared to even discuss that because that is an entire other level. <laughs> um, parish councils, like I said, it would not hurt at all if priests decided that at least one person on their parish council should have some sort of familiarity and skills with online work at some point. And at the same time, youth ministers, if churches that are large enough to have youth ministers, the volunteers who do this, that's a topic that they should be discussing with their young people. Now, I believe the Greek Orthodox Church has someone involved in youth work online, um, the B, you know, Be the B program and things. I guarantee you a year from now, after he's done, spent more time at it, at it, Father Stephen Damick of the Antiochian Archdiocese is going, he already knows a lot. He's been active for a while. But since he's been put in full-time ministry online for the Antiochian Archdiocese, where he's going to know a whole lot more about what forms of chat rooms, what forms of blogging, what forms of podcasting are having the best impact and which ones, and whether that impact is, first of all, impact period, but you're asking positive impact. You know, what is the content that actually leads to the human interactions that we need? If, if, if our jurisdictions are not asking this question and finding out who their skilled people are, then to some degree, we'll deserve the future that we get, if I can be so I'll, I'll tell you a true story, which will lead to a question uh, that comes from one of our, our Q&A. Uh, when we first started St. Constantine, we had kindergarten children go outside and to play. And we do unstructured play intentionally for some of these reasons. And the students stood in a circle around a ball waiting for instructions and then asked to go back inside and ask where screens were uh, so that they could have recourse to them. Uh, these same children will now go out and spontaneously play. So this is real. Uh, also college students, when they first come to us, will often sit in a room with each other, talking to each other by text, yeah, not for privacy, not, not for yeah. privacy. They're not having evil discussions. Uh, and uh, I believe that, you know, having talked to them, having some kind of relationship, they're more comfortable there. Is there a way in an algorithm culture 
I mean, it's all fine for the three of us, let's say, not to be too online. But when most people are deriving most of their information being driven by, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, Snapchat, uh, whatever is going on uh, in, in places that aren't even appropriate for us to go, uh, that are algorithm driven, uh, what can we do about this? Uh, and, and how can we begin to reach out and help people realize that it's harder, it's harder to talk to someone face to face and the cost of failing is very high. Uh, whereas talking to someone virtually has almost no cost you can ghost the person and just disappear. So how do we help people uh, move from online communication to the very high risk personal communication? Well, first of all, our parishes are gonna have to play some role in this. In other words, you're asking the question, how do we do this? My, the main point of my talk today was, we have to face the issue that we need to do it. I mean, that at That's some point we have, to, we, we have to get an acceptance that these are issues that are part of the life of faith in our age, that there are discipleship implications here that we haven't been talking about and that we haven't been discussing. So today I was just trying to make a case for starting this process out in the open and discussing it bluntly. But I want, I want to flash back to something Father Chad said. I totally believe that our seminary should be talking about how we do evangelism and how we use the technology better. But I, if I can dare do this, I want to flash back to Denver Seminary again for one second. All kinds of people thought that when we started a program on mass media and the church, that we were going to teach Protestant churches how to use media in their worship services, mm. help them hang movie screens, you know, and, and, you know, dry ice and laser beams, you know, and what, and that we were going to use media as evangelism. Well, the late Dr. Haddon Robinson, who Billy Graham called the greatest teacher of preaching in the English language in the world, Haddon was the other person with me in that project at that time. And doc, Dr. Robinson said, they, they, they think we want us to do better Christian television or we, we or to use the question now, we should do better Christian internet. Well, there's another half of this equation. What I was trying to do in my classrooms was not teach people how to use TV better in the church. I was trying to get priests and pastors and others to realize what is the culture saying to our people? This, this concept of a signal is when the culture is raising issues and, and putting out massive blocks of emotional, entertaining, formative material on topics, and our churches aren't even listening. We don't even know what the culture is saying to evangelize our own people, which is why I made that class I did. The context there was not better media evangelism. It was apologetics. It was trying to get the church to actually listen to what the culture was saying. Um, a, a brief example that goes flashing way, way back. I did a talk on this topic to a bunch of supporters of the seminary. And afterwards, I had all kinds of ministers coming up to me quietly and hushing in a hushed, hushed voice, pulling me aside and saying, what did you think of Thelma and Louise? And I said, well, first of all, movies that depict violence against women really drive me crazy. So I haven't seen Thelma and Louise. I have an entire thick research folder on it, and I know it's a very important film. I said, what do you think of Thelma and Louise? And at this point, now they're very uncomfortable. I said, well, why did you raise the issue? And one pastor said, well, all the divorced women in my church are all talking about it. Everybody, all the women are talking about this movie. And I said, and your problem is you can't admit to them that you've seen it, right? And he said, of course I can't admit I could, I've seen an R-rated movie. I said, so you surely couldn't preach about it. You couldn't say this movie is raising questions about workaholism and the abuse of women 
and the pain in the lives of many women, you couldn't address this issue because you would have to admit that you've seen the movie. And yeah, pastor it, after pastor said exactly right. So uh, this is so important because what so many people did so poorly was they took cultural artifacts, uh, a little bit like a, a bad sort of apologist takes books, classical books, and they did uh, what some of my friends called the Jesus juke on them. Yeah. Uh, oh, really? This film is about Jesus. Uh, look, Iron Man is a Christ figure, and I'll is teach it, yeah, a relevant course. sermon because I do a Jesus juke on it. Uh, and I get to have two or three about, fun clips, too. Right. Put clips up and, on the screen, too. Instead of talking about uh, millions of people went to see this film, here's this film in its own right. Here's what this film is straightforwardly teaching us. Uh, and here's what the church teaches about that idea uh, and putting them in distinction and having a discussion about the cultural artifact. Uh, it would be like talking about Dickens, mining it for Christian idea, Charles Dickens, the novelist, uh, and not right. talking about Charles Dickens' actual books. Uh, there's a kind of illegitimacy to this uh, that's really amazing. So it's worth saying uh, that what you're not saying, because I've known you for a long time, is to Jesus juke, pardon the expression, Father Chad, I didn't invent it, uh, our way through cultural artifacts. Uh, hey, youth group, uh, this Marvel film deals with sacrifice, and that's just like Jesus. Uh, that's useless. No. Uh, in fact, no. worse than useless. Excuse me for interjecting. I, uh, I just want to let our panelists and participants know we're under 10 minutes to go until our allotted okay. uh, uh, time is out. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I raised the Marvel films for the reason I think if, if I remember correctly, I'm getting old. It's hard to remember everything. I um, think I wrote a column about this. Did anybody notice that in the Marvel Avenger films, and we got to the final movies, I haven't seen all of them, but in the, in the big moment, half the human race vanishes. There are no funerals. There are no clergy. No one is asking, why did God do this? When, when you look at the population of planet Earth, a large part of the population would ask the question, why did God do this? I mean, so it was, a, it was like a universe where you have demigods walking around, you have miracles, you have superpowers, but we have none of the actual questions of humanity that people ask beyond Greek. That's what I would call a signal. Now, my goal there, obviously, is not during an Orthodox worship service to show a clip from the Avengers or something. My point is to say, sometimes we need to notice what our culture is saying to us and at least talk about it. And it's, I frankly think this can happen in the, in the context of retreats, you know, or, uh, or youth group meetings or whatever. But it's more about hearing what the culture is saying and responding with the voice of the church than saying, oh, here's the gospel according to the Avengers. No, it's more like, what does the ancient church fathers have to say about death and grief, you know, and the sense of loss that our culture is having trouble dealing with? So I want us to respond from a point of strength of what the church has to say on these topics. What the church has to say is, is problematic. And I, Father Chad, I'm as curious about what you'll say about this as anything. Uh, Father Photius uh, asked this, the curse of the internet is that it's the truest democracy the world has ever known. Uh, everyone has a voice, uh, the wise and the foolish. I'll, I'll point out it's the truest democracy for people with internet connections, but uh, the wise and the foolish, the benevolent and malevolent. In addition to addressing this from the pulpit, what positive steps can parishes take to countering the misinformation and disinformation found from the quote unquote orthodox online sources? I can promise you that if you go on a Twitter feed, uh, Father Chad and Terry, you'll either get ortho bros who have some very bizarre, almost misogynistic uh, view of what orthodoxy is, or uh, other sources that will remain nameless uh, that are, uh, for the sake of the members here, happy to name them myself, but uh, who are uh, falling short on orthopraxy, let me say, uh, the practice of orthodoxy. Uh, they're just overwhelming mainstream voices. Uh, what do we do about that? 
I mean, Father Photius is asking a good question. How, how do we respond to that? Shouldn't we respond? What I said in the lecture is we cannot stop their initial contact with the bad and the confused and whatever. But if we don't discuss this, and if we don't, if we don't, if our parishes don't have resources that help point them toward the good, we're not even involved in an argument with the bad. And um, you can't <coughs> stop people from doing those searches and coming in contact with the crazies. Yeah, that's right. Can be so blunt. But we need to have places to send them, and we need actual analog human flesh sacramental contacts in our parishes too to help with that as well quickly with these people when they come through the doors yeah i think that it would be really helpful if our own hierarchs actually began to speak out about these sites and direct people to sites that uh are not so angry uh and father photius has put it really to us well our own parishes need to be taking control and become the feed, you know, to the faithful. Uh, diocese could do a much, much better job. Uh, again, I'm not to be critical, but you know, the Assembly of Bishops declared this the year of the youth, and I'm still trying to figure out, so what's happened? You know, the year's half up, but this is the <laughs> perfect kind of topic that ought to be addressed in a topic like the year of the youth. You know, Terry, you asked the question, you know, when you said doctrine is destiny, where are our children? Where are our converts? Where are our priests? We've got a priest shortage, a vocation crisis. What are we doing to encourage them? So we need to create the positive voice. But I mentioned anger, one of the church's passions. I can tell you as a priest, I've never dealt so much with anger. Again, hearing mm -hmm. confessions, people will say to me, well, I'm, I'm angry. I ask the question, and what triggers your anger? I don't know. I'm just angry. Well, when you actually then delve a little deeper, you find they spend an enormous amount of time on very negative, hate-promoting sites. And that's something that they internalize, and it becomes something that they're totally unaware of. I find, now that I'm traveling again, I think much of our American culture, these people think they're invisible. The rudeness of people uh, trying to board airplanes, other kinds of things, is much ha heavier than it was uh, before we were also immersed in this world. And I think one of the problems in, again, it's cited by Father Photius, there's no accountability. So everybody is their own voice, their own agent. And I think many people think they're invisible, so they act rude. Technology shapes content. Yeah. And one of the things the internet does, what it does better than anything else, is divide us into tiny niches of, of yes. true believers yes. who yell at each other about why we're right. Yes. The, the term is an information silo. We yep. see this yes. in the news business. We see this in entertainment. And our in the last 15 months, our priests have, pastors in all traditions have come face to face with this in their churches. We, you know, we can think, I don't want to open up the subject of political conspiracy theories. But the mm -hmm. point I'm making is that the, the technology is the same. The same phenomena is happening. Small groups of people, you know, yelling at each other about these things. Um, yes, yes, by all means, it would help if, if our bishops and our priests were to help us develop some positive alternatives to this. I really think a library page in church websites where we say we actively encourage the use of the following resources. We the following people, we don't agree with everything they say, but they're trustworthy. You know, we're, we're not going to stop people from using the Internet. Right. We're going to say we want you to have the Internet in your life in a certain way and to be thoughtful about it and critical about it. And most of all, to realize this is not where the Orthodox faith primarily dwells that if, nothing if can I, replace the sacramental community. If I don't say it now, we have sadly run out of time on a topic that I could talk to the two of you, I think, uh, forever. Uh, I always like to end class this way. Uh, if uh, both of you could give us one sentence uh, that sums up how you're feeling at the end of this. Uh, I, I think if there's one sentence that I would say, I'm not a priest, I'm not a bishop, I don't even play one on television, uh, Father Chad, 
Uh, but I would say this, uh, we have very good fasting rules that are very transformative for many of us, whether it's Wednesday and Friday, whether it's the mini fast from food of the year. I'm wondering if the bishop shouldn't consider helping the faithful take fast from social media. Uh, I mean, there are people that have to eat certain things because of their health. There are people that have to be on social media for their jobs. Uh, but we all know that most of us consume far more social media, far more media than we need for our work and probably more than is good for us. And I wonder if the bishops would even consider that. So my last thought is, as we conclude would be to appeal to you as the head of a seminary to say, uh, maybe the thing we should be most fasting from uh, even more than steak, uh, and certainly given my weight, I should fast from that more than I do. Uh, but, you know, is, is media. Uh, so that Great Lent maybe becomes also a media fast. Uh, we're, we're told, hey, uh, no media consumption during that time period. What we found with our students, were they couldn't do this themselves. We had to provide some uh, technological things, yonder bags. We locked up their phones at the beginning of the day and, and people couldn't access them because this addiction is so strong that even our students who wanted to not text each other couldn't stop. You know, it, it was like a cigarette addiction, really. It's the only thing I know to compare it to. So last, last words uh, from uh, my two co-belligerents here. Well, I like the idea that you've just proposed. I'm already thinking about maybe at least once a month having a screen-free Friday. Um, see how it works. If nothing else, it will awaken people to the fact that they are addicted. It's like when you, you go a couple of days without coffee and, and you've got a screaming headache, you then realize, oh, yes. I guess I was addicted. Sometimes it's a wake-up call. The last thing I'd say about this particular event we've done today is I think it's worthy of something bigger uh, and in person. Uh, so I think we should pursue this and, and chase this topic and I would like to actually invite some of our hierarchs to be uh, overseers, participants in that event. I would simply want to end, I know I said it so many times, and I want to end with my three questions again. And I, I would like our parish leaders to ask these three questions and then ask if it leads them to contemplate the seriousness of this topic. Look at your people. How do they spend their time? How do they spend their money? And how do they make their decisions? Can you really deal with the nuts and bolts of your ministry today and their lives without beginning to think more about what they're getting through all the screens in their lives and the impact it's having on them? It's a topic we simply have to address. If, if our host uh, will step in, uh, I would really like to urge people to visit the OCLI website to look at the St. Vlad's Leadership Conference for Emerging New Leaders, uh, if you'll allow me that commercial. And then uh, many people are asking when Professor Mattingly's paper uh, will be available or when this talk will be available, because there are a lot of people that want to share this to do what I hope are live discussions. So. Is it Father Deacon, I think, who's with us? Yes, yes. Thank you, Professor. So uh, real quickly, uh, yes, uh, this, this recording of this lecture will be sent out to registrants um, the following week, and then we'll, we'll put it on our YouTube page, the seminary's YouTube page, which you can find by going to our website, svots.edu. Uh, scrolling to the bottom, you'll see a YouTube icon there. Just click that one, and you can find us, or you can search, search for it yourself. Um, uh, but that may be easier if you go to our website and we'll put it up on our YouTube page, this recording and this panel discussion uh, for the public in a couple of weeks. But we want to get people who who are uh, kind enough to, to donate and register um, a little bit of um, priority for the next week to to watch it. So we'll send it out to you next week. We'll email the link out uh, to you. Um, and uh, what was the other thing that you had asked about, uh, Dr. Reynolds? Um I, nothing. We're, we're fine. Uh, if you send the link out, if you could also send out an OCLI link to the St. Vlad's Conference. I, I want to say, Father Chad, thank you for hosting this in the OCLI Conference. I could list the number of academic venues that are willing to talk about real issues uh, on the fingers of one hand, because uh, these real issues are divisive. Uh, you could tell people uh, to give up meat, and that's a little bit nowadays uh, correct. 
uh, that kind of goes with the cultural stream. Uh, but to tell people to give up their screens or that we don't have full autonomy, that all of my opinions are, are not equal in weight with the opinions of my bishop, uh, now you've taken to meddling, uh, as Professor Mattingly put it. And so I, I really want to commend this. Uh, it has to be hard as an academic leader uh, to be willing to uh, not just talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. We need to do that. We need to educate in that. But uh, I fear that we will lose more of the faithful over screens and Google uh, searches than we will over heresy over the doctrine of the Trinity uh, in the uh, years to come. Thank you. Well, it does take courage, but uh, I think the clock is ticking. And so it really is time to act. You know, as the deacon says in liturgy, it is time for the Lord to act. It is time for us to act. Amen. So uh, I guess I will uh, ask for you to pray and send us out with a blessing uh, as we uh, bring this to a close, uh, Father. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ our God, extend thy right hand of blessing upon the work that we have undertaken this day, that our words which have been spoken may be used for the glorification of your holy name and the building up of your holy church. This we ask in the name of the triune God, whom we glorify, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Good feast, Amen. everybody, for Pentecost. Thank you. Amen. Come Holy Spirit.